Perfect, so I'll move on to share my screen. Hopefully we can all see this, uh, this presentation. Is it on screen, Steve? Yes. Perfect, okay. So from now, uh, what I'm basically going to present to you is uh, a little bit of my experience as a fitness coach and uh, how I've implemented a physical development program for the goalkeepers alongside with the coaching staff and everyone else at Tottenham Hotspur throughout uh, three and a half seasons. And uh, today, more specifically, we're going to be looking at uh, what concepts or what aspects of this uh, physical development program uh, link up to the performance of the times for the goalkeepers. So I think that it is fundamental for myself to ask uh, a few questions before I start looking at the dives. And uh, the first one would be to define what are the fundamental game-specific actions of a goalkeeper. And uh, in my opinion, I think that regardless of the style of play or the tactics involved, there is one common denominator and is that the goalkeepers need to stop goal scoring opportunities from the opposition. And to do so, they utilize the dives to reach out for those balls that can go into the corners of the goal. Um, so basically, I have defined this as one of the most game-deciding actions that I would perform throughout a game. And later on, I go into the second question, which is what are the loads that they are expected to carry out from a fitness coach or a sports scientist perspective? I want to understand how many of these dives will occur throughout a game. I also want to know what intensity do these uh, are performed. And equally also, if we want to break it down into segments of time, how frequently, how densely this can occur simultaneously or, or um, linked up one after the other. Last, I think that it is important to also anticipate the challenges that they will face throughout the season. And this obviously includes potential injury risks that they might go through uh, from a generic point of view for the goalkeeper position, but also from an individual standpoint, understand which are their needs from that injury per, uh, prevention perspective. And equally start to think about how do they adapt or cope with the competition? How do they uh, absorb all the training stimuli? and how they will cope with the accumulation of fatigue and emotional stress throughout the whole year. Having done this, I think that for all fitness coaches, it's important to, to screen the physical capabilities of the players. I think in the figure on the right, we've got a little overview from the inside bubble, showing the physical capabilities that are necessary to play football in any position. So goalkeepers, of course, they need to run and sprint, they need to change direction, or throw the ball with their hands or kick it still like any other position. But I could think if we, <clears throat> if we start looking specifically at the dive, I think it's a very technical and uh, well-oriented type of jump. It's a plyometric motion, which the goalkeepers project their body in terms to reach for that ball and be able to, to save it and, and keep the ball out of danger. In order to understand their capacity to dive, then we can break it down into different aspects and utilize different areas of science and, and uh, uh, start to understand the, the dive from different perspectives. Of course, we can, as we see in the list of the in the left, we can look at the clinical tests from the medical staff, understand the chronic injuries and, and limitations to the movement. But later on, we start to, um, to add more technologies and understand the range of movement, the key joints, uh, how quickly they can interpret or react to game situations, the strength and power, not only in specific muscle groups, but then through whole mov movements and motions that are similar to the performance of a dive. And in this sense, it is important as well to, to try to break down and look at the jumping ability and the different components from concentric, eccentric phases, the landings, et cetera, to understand <clears throat> the capacities of, uh, of their ability to jump and how this can have a transference into the performance of a dive. Into a bit of water to clear the throat. So basically, in order to develop these physical capabilities, I think the first responsibility is to facilitate their ability to dive because this is what goalkeepers have learned from an early age. And they are the experts at diving. Of course, through goalkeeping coaching and through uh, sports science and strength and conditioning, we can optimize and improve the performance. But equally, we need to allow them to be able to dive in the way that they've learned since they're young. I think one of the first points is to allow for that necessary range of movement in the key joints. And as we've seen before, of course, it's important to keep good mobility and stability at the ankles, at the hips. But equally, in, in difference to all the other positions on the field, there's a larger uh, importance to that uh, thoracic mobility, being able to rotate, to extend, and equally to laterally flex. So alongside with the shoulder complex, they can reach to those balls that are far from their reach and be able to keep the ball out of danger. 
I think that we can achieve this through several structural musculoskeletal adaptations uh, through training and uh, uh, through strength and conditioning in order to improve the length of the fascicles in the muscles to uh, make stiffer tendons for better jumping. Uh, but equally, all we need to do is just to increase that intra and intermuscular coordination. Uh, first of all, trying to work on the specific joints and specific muscle groups, and then later on progress, as I say below, into, into uh, uh, training the movements rather than the muscles. No? Because I think that the biggest way to optimize the performance is, is to focus on motor control. Uh, and it is something that should be uh, low energy demanding and shouldn't, shouldn't carry over uh, an injury risk as we train through uh, the motor controller, uh, control learning. <clears throat> and I think that uh, it is a good opportunity for us fitness coaches to focus on this because we can start through isolating the muscle groups and trying to compensate or, or look at those weaknesses. <coughs> but later on, we really want to progress to create more integrative drills that are more similar to the actual performance of the dive on the field. So basically, we want to actually work through those movements rather than through those muscle groups. That is the whole philosophy of, of our interpretation of a physical development program. I think that later on as well, it's important to uh, increase the challenge through uh, trying to achieve that speed of execution because the dives are preceded by a reaction and interpretation of a game situation. And it is fundamental to execute the dive as fast as possible. So we really want to focus on that speed of execution rather than increasing the resistance to, through, excuse me, rather than increasing the challenge or the resistance through external loads that create slower movements. If I look specifically at optimizing the dives, I think that one of the things that I need to focus on is to adhere to those biomechanical um, characteristics of the dive. So we want to train them in an action specific way. Of course, we start to look at uh, similarly to what Matt was explaining before, they have a bilateral stance in this position, but equally we know that they don't push off through both legs at the same time. So we can take that factor as well to start to create drills in the gym that emulate the situation in which we push differently. We can do that basically through coaching, through cues. We can also start to uh, uh, integrate uh, asymmetrical loading, so don't load both sides similarly. We can change the vector and we can uh, change the anchor from which the resistance is, and this is very useful, particularly when we utilize uh, resistance bands, uh, bungees, and later on we can use uh, pulley systems, isonential equipment, which allow us to create anchors uh, for the vectors to uh, be able to guide and channelize uh, the force production towards the direction that we want to, in a similar fashion to, to what the dives happen. Equally, as the exercises and the drills start to get more comfortable, we can include different perturbations uh, and variability, not only within the drills, uh, but within each repetition. So we can make sure that every repetition becomes different. There is maybe some challenge or some obstacle that makes it more difficult to uh, sustain the same type of performance between the same repetition of a drill. And finally, the last step before integrating already into the, the competitive action of the dive would be to increase those cognitive demands and we can start doing this through a simple reaction. So there is a preconceived uh, movement that will happen, they know in which direction they need to move, uh, but only a stimulus is presented to them and then they react towards it. Equally, if we want to increase that challenge, we, we include interpretations, which means that uh, the, the action could go into any direction and the stimulus will not only bring the information of when to do it, but where to as well. So that obviously increases the cognitive demands, even if the movement itself is the same as we were using before. And finally, as a last slide, I would like to uh, talk a little bit about that holistic approach to the dive, because uh, if we keep it in isolation, it is a little bit easier to understand how the dive is performed and how to train it all through the segments and then through a movement on its own. But I think that one of the um, biggest opportunities that we have as fitness coaches is that we can improve their predisposition to dive successfully, as there are several other aspects that happen and uh, other actions that precede the actual action of saving. So I think in order to do that, we can start to work on that motor control learning and, and automatize those key multidirectional patterns, movement patterns that they produce before they actually do a dive. One of the first concepts that I talk about is keeping that 180 degree vision because they need to be worried about what happens in front of them and not behind them where the goal is. And equally, they need to have a linear focus that, that draws that line between the goal where they need to be standing and the ball, the position of the ball. So there'll always be 
um, positioning themselves on the field of play according to those two objects. I think that then right before the, the dive happens, and like Matt was explaining and showing in some of the videos, we can see that the goalkeeper changes his body posture and goes into more of an athletic stance. And in this situation, they give themselves the ability to, to charge, to load their muscles, to activate, and they're in a good predisposition to then react accordingly to wherever the side of the ball is going. I think that this charge mostly leads into a shot when we can interpret that a shot opportunity can happen, but many times the shot doesn't happen. So in this situation, we want to look at, okay, where is the position of the goalkeeper? Can we gain a little bit of space, like he was showing from, from the example of Hugo, that he said uh, that he usually stays quiet on the line. That is something that has been coached to make sure that he can have as much time as possible to interpret the flight of the ball, to give himself a good opportunity to, to move with his feet and, and to gain that little bit of time that then translates into that little bit of distance between the hand and the ball that can make the difference. Mostly when this charge happens and the ball is changing or the game situation uh, avoids the shots and a goal scoring opportunity, we start to teach, okay, you can keep that charge, but then you need to adjust laterally to the position of the ball. So we start to coach. You can do a very small sidestep where uh, you're just sliding basically both feet but keeping a really good contact on the ground. So if the shot happens at any time, it's basically like a charge, like a charging position, but just in a moving uh, sequence. But equally, let's uh, imagine a second example where the ball can be on one side of the box and it gets uh, passed to all the other side of the box. A shot could happen before, and then the ball position changes dr drastically. The goalkeeper is perhaps uh, on one side, uh, let's say on the right post, and he needs to move quickly to cover on that left post, which is the closest to the ball now. We will then coach to do that crossover step to cover that area as fast as possible, and then turning the body in order to create that charge in the position where the ball is in a potential second goal scoring opportunity. But equally, we also need to know this dive is not a dive from the center of the goal, it's a dive from a side of the goal. And we know that we're coming from the right to the left, so we're leaving more space on our right side. So sometimes we need to work against that inertia, against that momentum, going from right to left and thinking that the shot can happen to our right side. So there are several things that we can take into consideration before we actually produce the, the movement of a knife. Of course, there are other tactical um, aspects, such as uh, many times we've been seeing in the videos, uh, the safe happens after moving backwards, the safes happen after moving forwards, the safes don't only happen laterally, they happen at an angle, slightly forward, slightly backwards as well. So there are different angles at which we can push. And uh, of course, there are other aspects that happen around or after, immediately after the, the action of a safe, because uh, of course, from an injury prevention perspective, we also need to think about the absorption of the impact as, as the floor is quite tough and goalkeepers are, are accustomed to this impact, but equally we still need to protect all the spine from the cervical area all the way down to the lumbar spine. And equally, what happens if there is a second action from that shot? As in many times we saw with the Rui Patricio uh, situation, of course, it didn't have much time, but equally we need to think, okay, if the shot uh, isn't blocked or isn't out of danger, what happens if a second action can happen? We need to also work on the goalkeepers to reincorporate back into their feet and be able to um, react for a second action, a second shot on target. And this was just a little uh, overview of how we implement a physical development program. So thank you for this.